So welcome to Becoming an Ayn Rand Hero, where we use the ideas of objectivism and Ayn Rand to live a life and a lifestyle that is heroic, something that we're excited about like we get excited about Ayn Rand's characters. And today we're speaking with Dale Halling, who is a whole bunch of things. Really interesting cat, this, this Dale guy. So an intellectual property attorney who works with some interesting clients and has some very frank business strategies for intellectual property. I, I respect that about you, Dale. I like that Thank about you. you, right? But also an author, and an author of both fiction and nonfiction, right? He has uh, two uh, fiction books about uh, a character named Hank Ranger, who is really great. I've, I've enjoyed those books greatly. And, and then there's, a, there's another bit you can get, which are kind of unpublished bits or haven't, haven't been fit into a book yet and some backstory and things like that. So very interesting characters, very interesting subject matter in the, in the fiction, but then straight nonfiction in terms of intellectual property and how it relates to the economic decline and fall of the United States or the rise of the United States. Yes. And, and uh, your latest book is The Source of Economic Growth, in right. which you really approach economics from the question of what causes the extra, what causes the growth. And you take a critical eye at most of the economic theories and offer uh, perhaps novel, perhaps revolutionary focus of economics in terms of property, intellectual property, that, that has the possibility of really creating not just a descriptive, oh, here's what happens in economics from a particular perspective, but how can we actually optimize the system so that we get the kind of growth that we want, right? So Dale Halling, interesting character. Welcome, Dale. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, great. So it's, ra it's Ranger, even though it's an A R. Ah. Okay, so in the character, in the in the thing, uh, in the books, we we say that over and over. It's it's Ranger with an A, actually two A's. <laughs> uh huh. Well, I missed that part in the book. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Oh, it's Hank Ranger. Ranger. It definitely comes off the tongue better. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. So, so uh, wh what I want to do is open up the conversation about how Ayn Rand has fit into your life and how she's impacted your work. Because when I read your work, the, the connection, the, the sense of life, the clarity, the themes all seem to me of a piece. And so I want to talk to you about that. And I thought I'd start by asking, so... How did you encounter Ayn Rand? What, what, what's your story with Ayn Rand? How did that come about? Yeah, so um, the way it came about is my, I, I was in college and, and I sort of made a goal of reading more. I wasn't a big reader in high school. And uh, my mom suggested this book called The Fountainhead. Mm -hmm. And I started reading it just before. So I was a, in electrical engineering major. I started reading it just before the fall semester finals um, <laughs> in, in, in fall semester finals of my sophomore year. Mm -hmm. And I started reading it, and I realized I couldn't study until I finished the book. So I stopped doing any work on finals <laughs> so and just read continuously until I finished uh, The Fountainhead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she almost ruined my finals. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and what was it about what was it about Fountainhead that had you just you had to keep reading it? It's like you knew that you knew that you wouldn't be able to focus on other things. What was it about the book that that captured you in that way? Yeah, I, you know, um, it's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, but um, you know, one of the things that captured me about it is that the Fountainhead to me is sort of a retelling of Galileo and the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, which was actually, uh, I was raised Catholic, so it was a very influential story in my life. 
Um, and, and, and it was, you know, I was a, a hero, um, and it seemed to have those sort of themes that had already hit me in life before. Um, and I just, I had to know what was going to happen next. Mm -hmm. And, and having read it and having had the example of Rourke, right. And the contrasts of Tui and Keating and Wynand and even Dominique, what did you get from that? D did you read it and go, oh, that was an interesting book. That was captivating. I, I love the fiction story of it. Or did it have an impact? It definitely had an impact. Um, you know, I've, I've reread it recently. Um, and, and I am surprised if you listen to the courtroom speech and other things. There is a lot of... Clearly, she's actually worked out a lot more than I would have thought just based on memory. Mm -hmm. However, the story, of course, is very personal. And, and there's very much this, you know, you go off and do your own sort of thing, which is not exactly how Atlas Shrugged comes across. But I had to read Atlas Shrugged because of it. Um, mm -hmm. That was clear. And, um, you know, I... I I don't think anyone was going to say I wasn't fairly individualistic before I read the book, but it, it certainly reinforced, you know, it reinforced a, a number of, you know, things about, you know, stay true to yourself. And, and of course, unfortunately, when I got into the corporate world, uh, Tui um, became a much more obvious character in my life. <laughs> so, okay, so there's, there's, there's so much there because translating the novels into real life is you know really what my work is all about right uh yeah. in, 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 you can focus on the philosophy of Ayn Rand or epistemology or ethics and politics and all fascinating right but the, but the part that really interests me is okay so you're you're living a real life you're working in the corporate world you you're dealing with people how do her novels how does her work and her heroes how do they inform you so how Tui became much more uh important as a character once you got into the corporate world please say more about that well um you know unfortunately the reality of big corporations um which which doesn't come through in in rand's writing is is that they're actually very socialistic um maybe not all of them but all the ones i worked for some were better some were worse and you present a rational position and you suggest that, you know, the corporation or this group goes that way. Uh, and then you find, unlike, you know, um, much like Tui, he didn't, no one opposes you directly. Everyone undermines you in ways that you can't. It's like punching a balloon is the way I always talk about it. It's like being inside the balloon and punching it. It shifts around. You can raise these points seriously with somebody and they'll agree with you 100%. But somehow the balloon never really seems to do much. It stretches, but it always comes back. Uh, and I don't, that, that is a common feeling, I think, for, for many people who've been in large organizations. Um, and it's a little different because I also worked in the law world, uh, law, you know, like law firms. In law firms, partners can be bigger than life, which means that they can stomp around and make a bunch of noise, and it seems like it's less congenial of an atmosphere to those people who suddenly go to the corporate world. They don't understand in the corporate world, they're, they're Ellsworth toing you. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's um, uh, it, that part, is, at least as far as Ellsworth to I, I think, um, you know, it just has this, it gives you, unfortunately, this understanding of what happens. I mean, if you delve into politics much, you feel that it, most people feel this way, too. You push, you push. Even when you seem to make some progress, it just seems to snap back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to return to that because I, th I think this is one of the, the great insights of Ayn Rand and the great uh, statements of the challenge in front of us in terms of you know making our own great life and actually making an impact on the world whether the world is a corporation that you're working in or whether it's a community that you're a part of or whether it's a discipline that you want to influence 
<laughs> right. Yes. How, how do you do this? Okay, so so you read Fountainhead, and then at at that point you realized that you needed to read Atlas Shrugged. Did you read it while you were in college again? Did did reading the Fountainhead kind of put you on an Ayn Rand jag where you read everything that she wrote, or what was that like for you? Um, I wouldn't say it was. I definitely did read everything she wrote. I did not like drop everything. But the next semester, I, I was an engineering co-op. I was working, um, probably got my first feeling for Ellsworth Tui, working for uh, a consulting firm. And, uh, uh, and so I, I read the, fa- or the Atlas Shrug during that semester. And then slowly but surely I read, you know, I read her nonfiction through, you know. So I was a sophomore, still had several more years, and then grad school. But by the time I was in grad school, I think I'd read almost all of her published nonfiction. Um, uh, again, I didn't just drop everything um, mm-hmm. and, and go after it. And, and you know, the, the Rourke also gives you the courage to say, okay, well, I'm going to still stick with my guns despite this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, okay. And so when you read Atlas Shrugged and Since... The, the big the big questions of her work are how does it apply to the real world? So when you think about Rourke, the, you've got Rourke and Tui, right? Rourke decides what he wants to do, and he just keeps going at it, and the logic of his position eventually wins, right? You, 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 you could say this. In the novel, it's a great thing about novels, romantic realism, <laughs> his, his strategy actually wins, Right. Yes. But, but but there's something about staying true to himself when when you contrast it with Peter Keating, where you could say Peter Keating won right up front. He got all of the honors, he got the promotions, he got the jobs, he won the competitions, but he was empty. Whereas Rourke went to the quarry and he was full. Right? And I don't know if you have anything to say about that, but. Well, yeah, no, I mean, it is an interesting thing. I mean, it's part of what, of course, is compelling about the novel. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's obviously less fun to do it in real life <laughs> <laughs> than it is to read about it in a novel. Um, and and uh, actually, of course, Howard Rourke never gets to say, I told you so. Um, but that, you know, when you're going through something like that, you always hope you get to say, I told you so. Um, and rarely do you actually get to do that. Mm-hmm. So, um, go ahead. Yeah. Well, so, so, so you, you went to graduate school by this time, you've essentially gotten familiar with the corpus of Ayn Rand's work. And now you're going out in the world and you're dealing with Tui's and you're Rourke is giving you, you could say, extra backbone to stay on what you think is true and where you think the value is. But how does how does that work in the real world from your experience? And and given the challenges that you faced, how did you take the challenges and turn it into the stance that you took in your market, the business that you built, how how you've approached your process what did you learn from it how did it play out well um so it's always probably the single most important thing is giving me the courage to make big decisions um you know it's very easy to not make big decisions so i was at mcdonald douglas um uh in a fairly high tech area um and when i i went off and went um, after about three and a half years there, I went into sales at Tektronix. Uh, and, you know, everyone thought I was crazy for doing this and, and tried to talk me out of it. Um, I'm not saying it was the world's greatest decision. Uh, although, you know, moving around, it, it, job headhunters don't like this and, and employers are not. But as far as your own personal experience... And, and people I've read who probably had even more courage than me, you know what, moving around, you learn a lot by changing jobs. You probably learn the most that first year. The longer you stay, you may move up the ladder better, but if you're actually talking about learning, it's probably that first year. 
So I, I went into sales for five years and went to law school, but I had the school, you know, the courage to do that. Everyone thought law school was weird. They still think, you know, they, they just don't get that as a patent attorney, I have a strong technical background and a legal background. They just, they want to pigeonhole me one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, I gave me the courage to write the books. It gave me, you know, the courage eventually, um, you know, so sales worked out better. It wasn't perfect. It was a good, but I learned a lot. Um, then I went to law school. My first job out of law school, I didn't like that well. And I, I had the courage to, to change jobs much quicker that time. Um, uh, my wife talked me into sticking around because Motorola wanted to hire me, and they did. But I didn't stick around there too long either because I was ready to move on. Um, and, and then I went and worked for myself. And, and there was a period of time after I started my law practice. Um, initially, it was obviously very hard. Um, you know, you don't know you have any money coming in. I didn't leave another firm where I had clients already following me. Um, you know, we moved to another city, um, you know, so you, you feel pretty uh, lost when you do that. But shortly with after the first year, for sure or less, you know, it was, it was probably some of the best time of my, um, the best time of my work career. And, and one of the reasons was that partly because the environment was conducive and allowed entrepreneurs to do well, but... When I dealt with entrepreneurs, I, for the most part, dealt with them in a very rational manner. And my clients tended, I mean, they tend to be engineers, not that all engineers are rational, but um, they tended to be engineers who were rational and obviously willing to take a chance themselves. So it was very exciting. Um, and for those of us who are technical background, I got to see So my big fear when I left Motorola was I was going to be working on like fence posts, little trivial technology. I actually worked on better technology the first seven to ten years after I left Motorola than I would have if I had stayed at Motorola. I got to see more technologies than the head of R&D from a large corporation would have seen. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. And and it's an and it's an example of you made a series of bold moves. Yeah, that, that you were willing to take big moves because, damn it, it's your life, and that's what you want to do. And and you could say that the individualism that you identified with in Rourke, and that you were inspired by in Rourke, gave you the extra gumption to make bold moves. And in the process, you tasted a number of different fields until you could create something where you get to bring together the various things that you've done into a coherent whole. Right. And because you were working with entrepreneurs, and I want to get I want to get back to that point, because you were working with entrepreneurs and because you were working, uh, you combining your legal and your technical capacities, you got to see all kinds of technologies that you wouldn't have seen in Motorola because it's a big corporation and you would have been doing some little role in a large thing. And it, it, it did I hear that right? So, yeah, it absolutely. Um, inside of a corporation they they would have pegged you know pigeonholed me although i will say that um you know it, being a patent attorney still allows you to see more than like for instance being an engineer in the groups that i was being a patent attorney for um but but compared to what i did after i left a motorola it wasn't even close mhm mm-hmm. okay and and when you were talking about working with entrepreneurs that that hits home for me because I work with entrepreneurs, right? And the thing that I like about it is that these are people who are making decisions. They're actually putting their selves on the lines. Like the choices they make directly impact their bottom line. And because of that, there's a connection to reality that allows for real conversation and real rationality. Right? They don't have large systems in which they're dealing with political issues. They're not dealing with the Peter Keating issues. They're dealing with the how do we build this issues? How do I actually create a company that works? How do I get profitable? How do I get the position in the market that I want to get? That working with entrepreneurs allows for that. Um, you said something towards that. Could you say more about that? 
Yeah, well, uh, I mean, entrepreneurs are great when they're getting funded. <laughs> Let's be honest. When they're not getting funded, uh, you know, life is d difficult. And, and they're, but when they're funded, what they care about is are you accomplishing the task and moving things forward? And they don't, they just strip away all the extraneous stuff. Um, the politics seems, like you said, seems to go away. And in my case, you know, and, what, and, and certainly was uh, true in the time um, because they could get funded, these people were doing world class revolutionary stuff. Um, and so it was just exciting all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and that, you could say, brings us back to the Atlas Shrugged kind of characters. Because when you're working with revolutionary stuff, when you're actually pushing the boundaries of what human beings are capable of, there's something about that that is inherently inspiring to a certain kind of person with a certain sense of life. There's a sense of adventure and aliveness about that. Right? Absolutely. I mean, that it's just... Um, you know, I, it's, it, it is, it is a, it's a wonderful time and everything's about whether you can accomplish stuff and, 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 and it's, and you are seeing, you know, revolutionary stuff being born. It's, it's a wonderful, I, I, I can't, you know, it was the best work environment I ever had. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and in that you went, you went from that and then you decided to start writing books. How did that happen? Well, um, so sometime, I, I date the time of, uh, in, you know, that tracks my book, The Decline and Fall of the American Entrepreneur. Sometime in the late 90s, 99, 2000, um, there was an attack. It started with this attack on Amazon's one-click patent. Almost all the information out there is, is nonsense. Um, and this was an attack on, on inventing. Um, and unfortunately, it led to some other things. It, it led to an attack on Sarbanes Oxley, or, or Sarbanes Oxley, which makes it very, very hard for venture capital firms to survive unless they play crony games. And it also makes it very hard for entrepreneurs, therefore, to get money or go public. And I noticed this difference. When it first started happening, I was so busy um, that I, my wife said, you know, you should write some stuff on this. And I'm like, you know, I don't have time. And then, you know, I send this into Forbes or wherever and maybe they'll publish it and maybe they won't. And I've now wasted time when I could have been doing billable stuff. Um, so I didn't pay attention to it. And it came back. Um, uh, so my wife was right again. Came back to <laughs> haunt me. Um, probably about 2005 is when it hit home to me that 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 this was that things have changed significantly. Strangely enough, um, it's 2004 for me, which I think is probably not that different for those of us who are in the high-tech startup business, was a, a pretty good year. I don't think that people had realized how damaging Sarbanes-Oxley was going to be. Entrepreneurs, the, the one downside, that I love their optimism. You know, no entrepreneur, no, no entrepreneur succeeds by being a pessimist. Mm -hmm. But... The one downside is, is that they, they think, that some of them think that no matter what the world throws at them, they will succeed. And, and while that's a wonderful attitude, I'm sorry if you were in the middle of Soviet Union in 1950 under Stalin and you were a world-class entrepreneur, you would, you would probably be dead. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't overcome everything. Um, and this is, you know, I, I, I talked to, in fact, a venture capitalist told me after I wrote my book, The Decline and Fall, he said, yeah, we'd love to talk about this, but we can't. We're, we're in this sort of catch-22 that if we say that to our investors, then they're going to want their money back. Um, and and um, so we can't, we can't be, we can't be complete, we can't raise our next round. We can't be completely honest about the damage these things are doing, both Sarbanes-Oxley and, and the patent law changes. Um, and... I was amazed at how unwilling they were to stand up and say what was going on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, again, it, it sort of reminds me of uh, Atlas Shrugged. They're putting in all these regulations and no one wants to stand up and argue against them. No one wants to um, 
no one wants to face them. Yeah, and and they they knew it was hurting their business, um, and, and but they weren't willing to. They weren't. There were some here and there, and then there were a number of big venture capital firms who figured out how to play the crony capitalist game real well. Um, the ones I think that were more honest were more likely to to invest overseas. They invested in China and India and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, actually, because you have an inside track on this, if, if you could just take a minute or two and, and talk about what, what is the impact of Sarbanes-Oxley, and this gets into a declining fall of the American entrepreneur, what, what, was, what was the essential uh, argument of that book? And to the degree that you can, to talk about how that relates to Ayn Rand's ideas. Yeah, well, I think it's completely. I, I cite Ayn Rand in that book several times, um, but I think the overall idea is completely consistent with Rand. The overall idea, really, what what started for me was this idea. Well, it, it, as a personal story, what happened was I had these clients who would come in in the '90s and, and early 2000s, and they would say, "You know, I'm working on this new stuff. I'm going to create this big company. I'm going to do this revolutionary technology. We're going to go public. We're going to make you know millions upon millions of dollars. We're going to have lots of employees and so on." After Sarbanes Oxley, short. I mean, the, it was fairly quick change there. <laughs> Same clients come into my office. They were on their, their next venture. And they say, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna make this little thing that makes has a niche market that's gonna make the world just a little better in this area. Um, we're not gonna hire anybody if we don't if we can possibly help it. We're, we're we'll raise money if we can, and we're gonna sell out. The joke was everyone's gonna sell out to Google. Mm -hmm. um, so the same exact people come in and and. Now their perspectives are just totally different. Um, and, you know, the question was why? And again, I was so busy. I mean, that sort of parallels my first, the first Hank Ranger novel. I was so busy trying, you know, to raise a family and, and you know, grow my patent law practice that I didn't notice these changes. Um, uh, I noticed some of them. I assumed that they, I assumed like the entrepreneurs I was just complaining about that, you know, it wouldn't be that big of a deal that somehow we would work through this. One of the things for a while that happened in patent law, when there was a crazy decision or something, I tended to ignore it because usually it tended to be an outlier and it, and it faded off on its own. It sort of spun out in a whirlpool and had no real effect. But then, then things started having an effect. So the thesis of the book is, why did we have economic growth in the 90s and not in the next decade? And... I explain in depth why the only way we can increase our real per capita wealth is to increase our level of technology, which for a first world country means um, you've got to invent things. And it, they can't all just be invented in your mind and then you sit there, you got to implement them. Right. So yeah. technology startup companies, I said, were built on three things and they're the, the real drivers of, of the economy, of true high paying jobs and, and wealth creation. And they're built on human capital, built on financial capital and intellectual capital. And we undermined all three of those starting around 2000. Um, and I don't want to bore you to death, but <laughs> real quick, the intellectual capital, we changed the laws on patents in around 2000. The Clinton administration had tried to weaken the patent laws the whole time they were in office but then did not succeed until they left, just as they were leaving. But the Bush administration was happy to follow suit. Um, then we passed Sarbanes-Oxley, um, and I want to tell you, uh, there's a congressman who I liked, who I didn't pay attention to, um, Can't I don't know why I can't come up with his name. He was <coughs> part of the tax changes under Reagan. Anyway, uh, Kemp, Kemp, yeah, uh, Congressman Kemp, the former football player, and he wrote about how bad Sarbanes Oxley was just before it passed and how it was going to cause all sorts of problems and how it was all a sham. Um, and he turned out to be right and he anticipated what I would say later. 
Um, and then the other one was human capital. So, you know, Mark, if, you know, I needed a brilliant marketing person and you worked at IBM, the way I would lure you to my startup is I would give you these stock options. Mm -hmm. Well, they started requiring the expensing of stock options. So that made it very hard for me to lure you away, especially when you combine it with Sarbanes-Oxley, that the chance that my startup will ever go public is very low. So why are you going to leave my, te you know, this safe, secure job at IBM that's got a pension and everything to come work for my startup if I can't, you know, can't give you stock options very well and the chances of them ever paying off are very low. In fact, I, my brother is a researcher at uh, Mayo in uh, molecular genetics. And, and he's actually come to me and asked me several times because he's, you know, companies who are well funded but are startups, you know, should he think about doing this? And, and after, you know, about 2004, 2005, I'd started saying no. I told before them, I'd say, yes, you should really think about this. After that, I said, no, you're, you're too close to retirement. Things are too secure. The chances of this company going public are, are, are very, very small the way the environment is. So, no. Stay inside of Mayo. Mm -hmm. so, so, so it was kind of a, a one-two punch. Sarbanes Oxley, um, in, in okay, because because I actually I don't know that much about it. I've I've heard uh, the the basic argument, but it it'd be nice it'd be nice to get kind of a concise thing. How did Sarbanes Oxley impact startups going public, and and what's the scale of that? Because, you know, we always hear, oh, yeah, this regulation negatively impacted this industry. But it's like kind of a binary. Did it impact it negatively or did it not? And it's really the scale of it where it starts to kind of sink into your consciousness how much of an impact this has. So, yeah. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. So, so just how did Sarbanes Oxley, uh, Ox, how did it um, impact? the ability for companies to go public and what was the impact of that yeah i mean all three of them combined together so it's not completely fair to take them apart but i'm just i will focus on sarbanes oxley because that's what you asked sarbanes oxley um required all this um accounting rules and liabilities and when they first the sec first talked about what the cost would be they estimated it would be ninety one thousand dollars per company per year to comply. Mm -hmm. and now, for a startup, that's a, still a pretty hefty amount. But that is not what it turned out to be. It turned out, depends on the size of the company. For a, a big company, it turns out to be 3 to $4 million a year in extra a, accounting costs. Mm -hmm. for, even for a small company, you're still talking about a million or $2 million. So let's say... I mean, that none of that provides any value to your customers, your investors, despite what they said. Um, so when, when Adobe went public, they had $10 million in revenue. Now, imagine if you were, have $10 million in revenue and you're going to go public and suddenly you have to take on another $2 million worth of expenses every year. Right. Do you think you can survive that? <laughs> Why would you? You wouldn't. And so the people don't, people all talk about how brilliant they are to say that they're not going to go public when, in fact, no, this has been forced on them. I mean, people often don't know how regulations impact their decisions, just like they don't know why the price of oil went up. They just know that it did, and so they buy less gas. So in the case of Sarbanes Oxley, um, the number of startups that went public, uh, and I used to have these numbers off the top of my head drop like something like 90 percent. The U.S., in fact, many large corporations went private after Sarbanes-Oxley because of the cost. The U.S. was the only major industrialized country um, after Sarbanes-Oxley, five years after Sarbanes-Oxley, I think is what it was, that actually had fewer public corporations than it did 10 years earlier. Not, not only did it stop the flow of creating new public companies, it actually reduced the overall absolute number. Yes. And, and there was a joke among the investment bankers in, in 
London that they were going to put up a statue to Sarbanes Oxley because what people tried to do was go public outside of the U.S. And I think it works to an extent. Um, but if it worked really well, um, uh, I wouldn't have ever had to write that book. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so so, so com- by completely uh, stifling the American market for that, it made other markets more attractive and, and led to more overseas public offerings. Yes. Yeah, but, but not enough to make up the difference. No. no. Yeah, not even close. Okay, so, so, you've, so you've got the Sarbanes-Oxley in terms of how companies can go public, and then you've got some different uh, rules about how you can get options and having to expense them, which, which essentially, essentially means that when you're taking on the options, you're taking on tax burdens. And accounting burdens. And accounting burdens that make it so instead of stock options being really a gift, something, oh, okay, I take on, I, I now have a potential huge win if I can make this work. And very little downside to something that when you actually take on the stock options, you're actually taking on front side risk and front side com- costs. Is that? Um, yeah, the company is. So the, the, the impl- you know, of course, count- tax rules can be very complex, but they would always issue stock options that were out of the money. And as long as they were out of the money, you as the employee didn't have to worry about them until, until they were, until you exercised them. Yeah. Um, of which, by the way, some wonderful stories from around 2000 where, you know, people exercised their stock options and then held on to or were forced to hold on to the stock for a while. Um, let's say they exercised them in 99. Uh, they um, weren't allowed to sell them. The stock market crashes and their tax liability on the difference bankrupted them. And the IRS didn't care. You know, it, it, it just so. But going back to the specifics you were asking about, the um, what happens is, is the company has to show it as an expense. So now you're a startup and you have almost no assets. And all of a sudden you're having these wild swings in your earnings because you're reestimating the value of the stock options all the time. And I argued with accountants at length about this. Um, reminds me of some reg- recent arguments. The, 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 first of all, there is no expense associated with this. This is just complete, absolute nonsense. Um, anyone who's seriously looked at it has already made that point. There's no real expense. There's no phantom expense. There is a, there is a potential dilution. Um, and as long as that potential dilution in shares is exposed, there's no reason for this rule at all except to undermine startups. There can, I mean, for all the talk about why we did this, there is only there isn't a bunch of tax revenue. So why why make things complicated? Why what was so bad? Well, some investors like Warren Buffett complained that they couldn't tell what was going on. But Warren Buffett has a history of pushing rules that undermine startups. He like uh, both Steve Jobs and and um, my, Bill Gates. They're not afraid of other big competitors. They're afraid of two guys in the garage coming up with something, and they wanted to kill that. And and Warren Buffett's, by the way, a record when the economy was growing well in the 90s was miserable. He did very poorly. Yeah, he, he, he does better in a heavily regulated environment because he can predict the game better. Yeah, and he can manipulate it. I mean, his dad, you know, I don't know... It, in his early years, how or if he did this, but I suspect that. But certainly since um, about 2000, over and over, he has used his political, his, his pull to get deals that no one else could get. I mean, it's, I, I, you might call it negotiating brilliance, but I really, uh, you know, I don't even, I don't think that's what it is. But you call it cronyism. I call it cronyism, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. And then, and then to to finish this triad, the the human capital. I mean, I mean the human capital. Yeah. Y- yeah. So how how does that uh, fit oh, in? intellectual? Sorry, we we the human was the the or the stock options. The stock intellectual options. Capital, yeah. Intellectual capital is is patents and 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 actually. And this leads into source of economic growth. Your 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 latest book. 
Um, it does. I mean, they all do to some extent. The, the goals were different in the two, and, and certainly writing the first one is what caused me to do this. So there's been some research in economics, which um, started with a guy named Robert Solo. And <clears throat> Solo did this econometric study and was trying to find out, you know, so in standard economics, you know, we look at the inputs. I mean, in order for the economy to grow, somehow the inputs have to change. If the inputs don't change, then the outputs can't change. So the standard definition in economics for inputs are land, labor, and capital. And when they talk about labor here, they're just talking about Think of labor as, um, you know, humans as machines. They, they, they're not really talking about brains here. They're talking about literal labor. Right. Um, and he did an econometric study of the growth of the U.S. I don't know the exact time frame, 1950 to 1970 or something like that. Um, and, of course, the land didn't change. The amount of land didn't change significantly. So it was really capital and labor. And what he found is neither of them explained hardly any of the economic growth. Um, the capital, so in fact, when you adjust it on per capita basis, neither of those had any effect. And he called this thing a residual and was quickly picked up that this had something to do with increasing level of technology. Mm -hmm. um, now, interestingly, um, he, he wins the Nobel Prize for this, by the way, in economics. Um, but he does what so many people who seem to have started down this path do. He tried to shoehorn it into his present Keynesian ideas. And in fact, what he said after getting the Nobel Prize on this, well, actually probably before, he, he said, okay, I found this very interesting piece of data. By the way, <clears throat> creating new technologies <clears throat> is outside the scope of economics. Um, so we really, there's nothing we can say about it. What, they sort of model it as background noise. They say it just happens, and uh, at least from an economic point of view, it just happens. Economics don't affect it, so we just model it as this sort of background noise that that you know technology will continue to increase. Well, um, that doesn't fit the empirical evidence at all. Um, and then you know, a number of people have picked up on it. One of the people who you know, again, objectivists are not in love with him, although I, I do know objectivists who like him. Um, or part to what he says, is a guy named Paul Romer, who is the son of the former Colorado governor, uh, Roy Romer. Anyway, he picks up on this, and, and, and there's been an ongoing debate between people who are roughly on his side and people are on um, Solo's side. And he says, you know what, actually, in this process of creating new technologies is subject to... Um, economic analysis and, and economic policy making. Um, and, and the funny thing is when he explains it is he explains it in a backhanded way. He says, if you're India and you want to grow fast, well, all you have to do is copy the technologies of the first world countries and you'll grow really fast. So usually the way these third world countries are managed to grow so fast, even though they have low economic freedom scores, is they just copy the technology that's already out there in the West, either literally stealing it or just buying it. Um, you know, think about it, you're China and you're trying to build a telephone system. Well, you don't have to go through switchboards and analog switching circuits. You don't have to learn all this stuff. You can just buy a modern system with digital system that has a um, uh, cellular system, which is much cheaper to deploy. So they can grow very fast during this period of time where they're just adopting technologies. So usually his point is, for those countries, the goal is to get rid of these rules. The antiquated technologies. Yeah, well, and, and get rid of the rules that keep this technology from coming in. <coughs> they don't have to invent it. They just have, so usually they're capital control rules. He talks about them, all the, you know, a variety of different rules. Um, India had a... a, a set of rules that they wanted to make homegrown industries, so they had huge tariffs and other rules. They kept out, for instance, new cars. Anyway, um, but he says if you want to grow your Canada, the U.S. or Japan, for instance, your first world country, you've got to invent. Um, except he doesn't like the word invention. He likes innovate, which I don't like for a variety of reasons. He also 
Um, he doesn't call them inventions, he calls them recipes, which I think is just confusing. Um, uh, and I think this may be, in fairness to Romer, is because the Supreme Court has screwed up uh, patent law so bad that people sort of go away from it. But anyway, <laughs> bottom line is he says, well, he looks at property rights and he says, well, property rights encourage people to create new inventions and that's wonderful. But because he's wedded to some of neoclassical ideas, he says they limit the distribution of new technologies. Um, and the way he um, explains that is, is through um, perfect competition. I'm sure you're aware of perfect competition, per pure and perfect competition. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so under that, the idea, if someone has a property, if, you, if, if anyone has any advantage under pure and perfect competition, supposedly that's not ideal. And that's Romer's point of view. So he says, here's the deal. When we have property rights, you always have a bad trade. You either encourage people to create a bunch of new inventions, but they don't get distributed, or you get great distribution of the existing inventions, but you don't get new ones, or existing technology, but you don't get new ones. Um, <laughs> The empirical evidence doesn't back him up on this at all, um, right. but his solution, not surprisingly, he's been a lifelong professor until, uh, I guess, 10 years ago he, he left, but um, his solution is that the government should spend money, more money with universities and R&D labs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, so, 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 so to, to frame what you're saying so far, you've got Solo. Who, who shows up with this residual, says, okay, well, there's this kind of background noise called innovation or invention where things keep getting better and better and that's what actually explains the growth but there's not really much we can talk about with it right yep. and then Romer comes along and says actually we can talk about it that there are policy implications for this because we can move this forward but the way he approaches it is to say well the way to get inventions to spread is to socialize them to take away the private property part of it because if you take away the private property, then more people can share it. Whereas if you have property, then people are going to hoard it, and so it's not going to spread as much. Exactly. Right? But then you come along, and, and in Source of Economic Growth, I think you did a, a brilliant job with this. You say, actually, it's the property rights that has it spread. Whereas Thank when you. there aren't property rights, it actually doesn't spread as much. Am I, am I leading in the direction you want to go? Because your example around calculus with that, among other things, is just great. So that's, I want to lead you in that direction if that's not where you're going. No, no, that's wonderful. Um, you, because there are two questions. The open questions are, you know, um, and, and, and um, people will deny that, that patents encourage inventions, um, despite overwhelming evidence. And then they'll say, well, even if it does, it inhibits the distri distribution of them. Um, so... You know, um, I do give the example of calculus. So just I'll repeat it since you brought it up. Um, and that is, you know, none of us need to pay. We can all go to a university to, to I mean, a library to study calculus. Um, but I have almost never met and have only read of a few people who learn calculus on their own. They almost everyone paid someone to teach it. And the reason why is 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 learning information is not free. If 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 it took no inform if you took Romer seriously as ideas that essentially once the information is created, spreading it is frictionless. And with new digital technologies, we can see why people would feel that way. But in order to information is just you know um, it's just electronic bits, it's just voltage levels somewhere, unless people understand it and know how to employ it. I, I was lucky enough in my lifetime to meet the guy who is the inventor of the microcontroller. Hmm. And I always give him an example. And I say, okay, let's say you know you could magically go back. And you're going to invent the microcontroller, <coughs> microprocessor, microcontroller. To most people, they're the same thing. They're not exactly the same thing. But he was before the microprocessor, so he certainly anticipated all that. And you think, oh, well, if I invented the microprocessor and I wasn't, as he was, an employee of TI, then... I would be filthy rich, right? I mean, they're everywhere. But you go back, like Mark Twain in his uh, Connecticut Yankee in the King Arthur's Court, and you've got this 
microprocessor and you start building it and you think, well, everyone will beat a, bo- a door to your uh, p- path to your door, as they say. And um, no, because they don't know how to use it. You have to tell them how to interface with it, what it can do. And all of this, I mean, we call it sales and marketing sometimes on the business side, but on the other side, it's education. And we spend billions of dollars on education. Now, either all that money is wasted or it really it, it takes real resources to spread information, which includes new technologies. And, and it takes resources on both sides. In order, in order to spread the technology, you actually have to make a case for why it would be worthwhile for people to invest in learning it. Right. You, yep. In sales and marketing, you actually have to that is and that is a non frictionless process. Right. People spend billions and billions of dollars trying to get people just introduced to the product to say, look, here's this thing that if you used it, it would make a difference. That's that's not frictionless. That takes time and effort and money. But then also, once you decide, I want to learn it. Right. I, I, I think the, the modern day Internet is the perfect example Information is ubiquitous. There's an infinite amount of things that we could learn that would potentially make our lives better. But we have to choose amongst the few of all of that, what are the few things that we're going to learn? And then once we choose to learn them, we actually have to invest our limited resources in learning them. And having that partnership between someone who is um, actively wanting to teach you and has a financial stake in teaching you, and, and who will help you learn it, and you actually investing money into saying, I'm going to learn it, and therefore I'm going to put the time and effort behind it, that creates a synergy where technology actually gets developed. It actually gets distributed. It, exactly. And if you don't have property rights in it, I mean, I, I, I mean I've seen this both literally and I've done back of the, you know, a back of the envelope sort of spreadsheets on it. If you don't own that technology, then you spend all this time. So I go around and I convince, you know, just obvious examples. I convince uh, um, Amazon and, and Walmart to sell this, right? I've spent a bunch of time and effort doing this. And then I have to convince the consumer. So I've spent a bunch of time convincing the consumers that they want my, my end product. Then along comes somebody else and they say, boy, you're selling millions of these and I could produce these pretty cheaply. And they just say, all they have to say is, my thing is just like Dale's, but it's 5% cheaper. Um, and so, in fact, there are, there are a number of management books that are very clear. Um, I've pointed these out. They're very much like, no, you don't want to be the technological leader. You want to be the one that's second or third. Let the other people develop the market. Let them do all that hard work. And as long as there's no IP, then who cares that you can come in second or third? Well, you get burned by doing that two or three times if you're an investor or an entrepreneur, and pretty soon you don't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's funny, uh, 2009, 2010, I was working on a new technology for uh, uh, user-generated content using semantic language. It was this really kind of fun thing. When I was talking with investors about it, the first question they had is, can you patent it? Right. Can you patent it? Can you get intellectual property around this? Because if you can't, we are not interested. Yeah, that is it. very interesting. By the way, I only caught part of what the technology was, and I'm enough of a technology person that I'd love to hear exactly what it was again. Okay, great. So it's uh, uh, semantic language, RDF. Or, okay. Okay, okay. So, so it's, 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 a, it's a way of taking information and breaking it down into... Uh, concepts or units that a computer can process. So instead of a computer having to process text, you actually build into the text, into the nature of the sentence, the various relationships that you'd like to get the computer to get. So anyway, right. it, it's, it's a semantic language. And so it's sort of, sort of like an XML or YML thing. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. It, it, we, and there's a set of standards around it. There's a, there's a set of language conventions and ontologies around how you do it. And part of how you get creative with the ontologies uh, is part of the intellectual property. Got it. Yeah, okay. very interesting. Yeah, and, I, it was, and it was really great. And I, and I had this idea where you could actually create 
a competitor to Wikipedia where the users generated this computer readable code because the interface that you gave them uh, forced them and encouraged them to think in terms that a computer could understand. And, right. and, and it had this whole rating system and, and things like this. But the, the point was, it was a novel idea that had the potential that if it caught on, you know, you don't know, but if it caught on, it would create a new movement in the realm of how people understand data and how the computer can read what's going on on the Internet. Yes. Right. Which had both a tremendous economic potential and a, poten uh, a social potential. It, it, yeah, it was. There's huge value if you can get it to work. Huge well. value if you can get it to work, right? So, so I was excited about this, and we were shopping it around. And the the point is that there were many people who were interested in potentially funding it, but the the fundamental question, the the go non go, the non starter question, was can you patent it? And it's just an it's just an example. Unless you can have property rights around it, unless you can protect it once you've created it, the, the energy, the money, the intelligence, the, the people that you're going to get to be involved in that project is going to be limited. Yep. And that, like you said, back of the envelope spreadsheet calculations, that is an exponential function. Because if, if I could have gotten, we ended up, doing a rather extensive patent on the part that we felt that we could. Um, but uh, w there were certain parts of it where we, we wished we could patent it. But the laws, it was just not going to be feasible to get it done. And so we could not get the kind of funding traction that we, that we eventually want, that we needed in order to do it at the level that we wanted to do it. So, which, which, yeah, which goes back to the first book. The first step in going public is, of course, getting the initial funding, and patents are absolutely critical to that. Right, uh, and 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 that feed and that feeds back into the okay. You've got uh, Solo who who says, okay, there's this residual. We're going to call it innovation, but we don't we can't talk about it. Romer says, okay, we can talk about it, but the way to do it is to take away property so that we get easier distribution. And what you're pointing out is that no, it's actually the property rights that allows for the distribution because distribution is not frictionless. In fact, it's beyond not frictionless. It requires time and energy and genius. You've got to get people who are willing to invest their stored up capital, right? This capital thing, the more capital that's available, the more you can invest in these kinds of projects. But you've got to have, you've got to have the future where people are willing to invest in it. And that it's actually that property counterintuitively drives the distribution because it makes the profit pos possible and so it attracts the supply. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's interesting, you know, they talk about these collection of tech centers and what their skills are and how they work better when they're all in one area. I mean, one of the reasons those areas work well is because you have customers who are willing usually, they're, they're doing cutting edge stuff and they are willing to invest the time. Um, you know, it, it is a very, very painful process to sell even something that's wonderful when you run, when you run into an industry that, that just has a mindset that is just negative towards change. I, I have two, you know, not what I'd call sort of super high tech like in, in the old days, but I have two, two or three entrepreneurs doing some amazing stuff. Two of them, I can, we can do back of the envelope calculations really easily that they would save a billion dollars a year. They cannot get funding. They cannot get the industry interested in doing it. Ever in, in, in both cases, they're regulated industry, so that's part of it. Um, so um, anyway, I, just on a happy note or semi-happy note, um, I think when you think about this, this fits exactly into Ayn Rand's ethics. Think about John Galt. John Galt did not make his money. I mean, we have a banker in there, and, and he invested well. But the, the, the hero is an inventor. And while Dagny's not an inventor, she's a technologist moving technology forward. Um, and that is the ultimate expression of using your mind. Um, you know, production is not, it's nothing, I'm not saying when you invent things for production, but repetitive production is not the epitome of using your mind. And so 
the fact it, it makes perfect sense as rational animals that are distinguishing both survival and therefore economic distinguishing point is our mind and not of course we can't just think about it but we have to create things and we create new things not recreating which is production recreating the same thing over and over we create new things to solve new problems and that's how we get wealthy and it fits perfectly within objectivism you there mark Sorry about that. I I had accidentally hit the mute button. So, and the 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 objectivist critique of Marxism, right, goes right back to what you were saying about Solo, where you're talking about labor, but in in his calculations, labor is just kind of human beings as machines, not human beings as creative minds, and it's the yeah. addition of this creative mind to that equation. That, that Ayn Rand talks about and that you recognize this is, it's, it's the creativity of the new inventions and the technologies that create the opportunities for arbitrage, right? If you can save a billion dollars, you've got this, you've got, you've got this client who has this technology that could save a billion dollars, right? Well, any company, assuming that the, regula the regulatory burden and the patent are in place so that you can actually use it. Any company that takes on that new technology now has a greater profit source, right? By reducing their, by reducing their costs, they're increasing their profit, and that's going to multiply the growth of their company. But it's also going to attract capital into that industry because capital flows towards profit, and so that's going to drive forward that technology, which is going to lead to further technology and further profit. And now you've got a situation where there's lots of great jobs to be had. Because if you can get more human intelligence into that area where there's lots of profit, then there's just enormous opportunities to, to take advantage of that profit. And so you're going to start bidding higher for the most intelligent, most skill-appropriate people into that area and that's where you create the great jobs that's where you get the higher incomes and that's what's going to drive your economic growth am i understanding that Actually. yeah no that's exactly right and just to you know one um example from history um so before eli whitney created the cotton gin the u.s was producing a thousand bales of cotton a year and i'm going off the top of my head so don't count the exact numbers 10 years afterwards it's a 40-fold increase in the amount of cotton we're producing. Now, not saying that these people didn't have to do labor, but the only reason, the linchpin why that happened was because of the cotton gin. It caused a 40-fold increase in output in this area. Now, you can't do that with um, slick uh, marketing or, or management techniques. I'm sorry, you know, you might get 10 or 15 percent, uh, maybe if you're lucky, 30 percent. You can't do that by just moving capital around. It's new inventions that give you these um, returns in the economy that are, you know, they're not in percentages. They're, f f you know, these sort of four, 20, hundredfold. I mean, look at processing power, how much that has gone up. Those sorts of things, these, you know, um, factors of huge factors of changes, not just minor little improvements. And, and that's, that's, you know, that's, it's a perfect expression of the human mind. You know, it's the perfect expression of John Galt. John Galt's motor supposedly, you know, it obviously costs money because you have to invest the time not only to create it, but to produce, the, produce them. But after that, the marginal cost is zero. Um, by the way, that's <laughs> it's very similar to the human mind. Human mind uses 25% of your in ca daily caloric intake of calories, mm -hmm. much more than any other animal, by the way, on a percentage basis. Mm -hmm. But if you think really hard, you don't use any extra calories. So it's got almost zero marginal cost for being used. Hmm. I, I, I like that. I've never, I've never thought about it quite that way. I like that. Thank you. Random thought. It's in my next talk, so that's... Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we, we kind of think talk to talk sometimes. Okay, okay, so... 
So again, I'm, I'm asking the question, what are you doing in the world? What are the insights you're having and how does Ayn Rand fit in with this? And fundamentally, Ayn Rand is suggesting that the human being is a rational animal. It's, it's our capacity to think, to solve problems that allows us to survive and thrive. And therefore, people should be free to think and to act on those thoughts. And, and you're coming through your experience of working with companies and watching what happens when people are not free, watching how the increasing regulations is actually shutting down the process. And in the, proce in, in the process, you're actually recognizing, ah, here's the mechanism that explains what Ayn Rand was talking about from a philosophical moral perspective. Here's the actual economic mechanism that explains why entrepreneur works and why property is important in this process. Is that a fair way of putting it? Uh, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I, I have to tell you that I became, um, I became a little frustrated with the standard answers that I got from economics. I mean, so for instance, Hayek's you know, pricing mechanism. Well, entrepreneurs recognize that they can make more profit here, so they put money there. Uh, it sounds all kind of good and well, but if everything comes out to a balance at some point, um, it means that somebody, you know, has to act lightning quick. There's not real, and there's not real growth there. And it's not, uh, I'm not saying that there's no mind there. Unfortunately, economics has been taken over. One of the places has been taken over is by the people who, I would say, quote unquote, invest. There are people who are trying to find out whether the price of houses are going to go up next year or the price of wheat is going to go up or down, and they want to take advantage of those price fluctuations. I'm not begrudging those people. That's fine. But that is not what economics should be all about. Um, nor do we have we made great progress. If In fact, I was talking with my son the other day. You know, if we could predict it like we can predict a... Um, the trajectory of a ball uh, or a missile, um, then everyone would know what the answer was and no one could make any money off of it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so but, it's only the but, fact that it never really works that it allows this um, continuing game. But anyway, go ahead. Yes, well, and, and I, I, like that, I like that metaphor because to the degree that you know the trajectory of the projectile, a ball and missile to the degree that you know that trajectory you can predict where it's going to be at any point in the process and therefore betting about where it's going to be just becomes nonsensical because there's going to be basic agreement about where it's going to be there's no market right, right. however if you can look at the trajectory and see that the trajectory is going up <laughs> if you can see that trajectory is actually leading towards a wealthier world it doesn't matter that we can't profit off of a market of uh, guessing around it. We actually start looking at, is the trajectory going where we want it to go, rather than can we make a profit on the uncertainty of information about where it's going? Excellent uh, point. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah and, I mean, I'll, yeah, sorry, go ahead. And you're, and you're talking about what Ooh. is it that actually causes the trajectory to grow? <laughs> what is it that leads... To a higher standard of living, how do we, you know, in economics terms, how do we escape the Malthusian trap? And we do that by inventing faster than we reproduce. <laughs> yeah, that in in short, a, a short answer is absolutely that's a, a perfect answer. Right, and and the and Ayn Rand's philosophy leads to a set of policy prescriptions and cultural prescriptions about what we value, what we honor, what we admire, right? To bring into kind of some, the McCloskey side of the argument, for those who care. Um, it, it's, it's that her philosophy uh, fits very well with what you're recognizing about the actual economic incentive process in this. And what, what is it that creates real growth? Well, it's recognizing the human mind honoring the human mind and giving it freedom to actually create and that the more we do that the more we're going to get growth and it's the growth that we really want that's yeah i mean exactly okay and okay. i think that it's a perfect you know and it's not just i mean i focus on what i think and and i know in fact is the the linchpin so to speak but it just the way you describe it shows that 
because we want minds to be free, it's a perfect, if followed logically, you end up with Rand's rational selfishness or natural rights on a more of a political level. Right, right. And, and, and one of the things I appreciate about what, about source of economic growth when I, when I was reading it, it's like, okay, this, this, this is a, a mechanism that fits in all the way down. Right. What's the nature of human being is that we need to think in order to survive. We don't have claws and teeth of any. Right. What makes us thrive is using our intelligence. And we can. We're rational human beings. Right. We deal with reality. We use reason. And then we take responsibility for what it is that we're doing. We own what we want. And we take action towards that. And then if we can have respect, if we can. Right work in reality, use reason, take responsibility, and treat one another with respect. Actually give one another individual rights. Honor, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of property. Trade. I recognize that I'm not going to use force against you. You're not going to use force against me. We can see what, what's in our win-win best interest and allow that to grow. If we demonstrate that respect towards an ever more beautiful future of realization. Right? The, uh, the reality, reason, responsibility, respect, and realization. Right? These, these core ideas, I call those the five traits of the Ayn Rand hero. Okay. Right? That, okay. That your economic thinking right, fits an entire philosophical coherent position. Whereas most economics, it's, they divorce themselves from questions of epistemology and ethics Right? They, they're just looking at this one part of it, and so it's, it, it doesn't, uh, the, the roots don't take, they don't find good soil in which to go all the way down to reality and who we are as human beings. Um, yeah. I think part of the problem is the whole definition of a social science. <clears throat> and, and I'm um, making the analogy in my talk this uh, July at Atlas Society that, that in fact, you know, I think before Rand defined um, rational selfishness, m many, not everybody, would have thought of ethics as mainly having any real meaning in a social sense. Mm -hmm. You know, what difference does it make whether Robinson Crusoe, I mean, you can't steal from somebody. <laughs> yeah. You know, so many of the moral questions, you can't save anybody. So many of them, you know, particularly trite moral questions don't come up unless there's a social context. But in fact, Rand showed um, that it, it is, in fact, that, that ethics has meaning at an individual level. Now, it's even more um, in economics, it's more entrenched that there, can't, that ec that there isn't Robinson Crusoe economics, although um, enough economists recognize it that that's exactly what they call it, Robinson Crusoe economics. Right. Um, but... Uh, and, and that's one of the things that I run into when I'm discussing this because everyone immediately says, no, it's a social science. Um, and so, it, you know, you're trying to tie it to something that doesn't make it a social science, so you're clearly wrong. Um, but if you look at Rand's ethics, I'm going to tie it to what I call her meta-ethics. So Rand ties her ethics all the way back to life, um, and she recognizes that other organisms have ethics, which we also would not normally say. They have values. For instance, trees value water. They need water. But it's built into, the what in modern language, it's built into their DNA or their genes. They don't actually have any choice about their ethics. Their ethics is hard-coded, as is their knowledge of how to achieve those goals is hard-coded. And what makes human beings unique one of the, this brain, it gives us um, the ability to solve that problem multiple ways and to choose different values, but it makes us actually make that decision or find that information. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the ethics that we're involved with is an ethics of choice. And we yes. can be wrong, right? The tree can't, right? Or if the tree encounters water, it can't say no to the water, right? It's going to do what it's... What, what its nature is designed to do. Whereas human beings can actually make choices that go against our own 
self-interest, that go against our thriving. And therefore, because we can choose wrongly, choosing rightly becomes important. It becomes something to care about. And if you think about ethics from that perspective, right, it really is an individual process. How do you create a great life? And therefore, politics is the extension of ethics to groups. But I like how you put it, like when people talk about social sciences, what they really do is they take their social position and they import it back into ethics. And they only talk about ethics in terms of how you treat other people. It's basically politics masquerading as ethics. And they avoid the ethical question altogether. Whereas Ayn Rand focuses on the uh, ethical question and, and says, okay, you need to choose. Unlike a tree, you have to choose. And so learning how to choose what's actually in your best interest is, is a skill that you develop. Your ethical muscle is something that you need to develop. And that fits into politics, but politics doesn't decide what that is. That's previous. That's primary. And it certainly includes how you treat other people, right? Part of your ethics is how do you interact with other people? Right. Right? Because interacting with other people is perhaps one of the most important, valuable ways that you're going to live a successful life, that you're going to live a thriving life. The better you are at working with people in a way that doesn't uh, disintegrate yourself, the more integrity you can bring to your relationships, the more you can build truly interdependent partnerships where you're not dependent, you're not codependent. You're bringing your independence with someone else so that you can synergize, so that you can each bring your values and get win-win. But the more you have ethics, the more you can create that. Whereas the social sciences tend to say, you know, forget the ethics. It's really all about politics, but we're just going to call it ethics. <laughs> And that undermines the process. I don't know if I, I went off I, a bit I, there. Well, it undermines the process in a lot of ways. And, you know, um, and sometimes it causes us to jump into the middle of, e middle of problems, let's say, in economics. We jump right in the middle of a very complex problem and try to um, come up with an answer. And often the answer is, see how complex it is. <laughs> well, yeah, um, you know, if I try to explain, you know, how... Um, a helicopter works and I don't know about gravity and I don't know about um, momentum and angular momentum and so on well and I don't know about air as a fluid and fluid dynamics well I'm, never, I'm, I'm gonna come up with all such of nonsense you have to start from the fundamentals and work outwards if you start from jumping in the middle and work back you you always end up with nonsense and and, and this you know comes up ver ethics versus political questions um, um, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to delve into that too yeah. much, but anyway, it, if you don't start from the fundamentals in, in each case, you, you end up with nonsense. I, I will say, you know, I don't want to present this human brain. We can, we can make choices that are not in our interest, but the fact that we have available lots of choices, unlike the tree means if we're in a new situation, we can evaluate it differently, which is why we are so successful mm -hmm. when hey. we do use our brain. The tree only has one answer. Mm -hmm. That's that is the answer it has, and that answer is either right or it's wrong. And if it's wrong, it dies. Whereas human beings, um, you know, wait a minute. Actually, water isn't the most important thing right now. You know, breathing is more important, or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. we, we can make these highly complex choices, and we can find new ways to solve the obtain those values. Yeah. So, I mean, it's why we're successful, but it also has pitfalls. Right. And, and, it, and it, speaks to, it speaks to exactly the, the, the point that we've been talking about, which is that we can invent. That from an ethical perspective, when we look at what are the choices that are available to us, we can not only choose among the best possible choices that we perceive in any particular moment, which we, we might even call that an ethical process, is that we're actually looking at, okay, so what is the best possible choice? And learning to make better choices is what ethics is all about. But we can actually go beyond that. And, and the way I like to think about it is actually into the realm of aesthetics, into the realm of creation, imagination, invention. Right? We can create a new set of choices. 
we can look at a situation and actually create new choices that no one else has ever experienced. We can make a distinction that other people haven't made and therefore say, ah, I can choose to do this versus that. And that process of creating new choices, that invention, is what allows us to go beyond being in caves or being, you know, tribal, uh, you know, apes that stand upright. Or apes that make hand axes, which we did for, I think, almost a, a million years. Right. Made Unchan essentially unchanging. Yeah. Right. There was an there was an initial invention that everyone else just did. And that initial invention fundamentally changed what was possible for human beings. But it was it's the process of invention itself that allows us to transcend. And I think that that's fundamentally an aesthetic process. It's the inspiration. It's the creation of something new, something better. And once we've created it. We can then choose it, and it becomes an ethical question. But the process of creation itself is in the realm of aesthetics, or what I call realization in this five-tier system, right? Realization. So, yeah, so I divide um, a little differently than Rand. I divide human creation so that everything that's a human creation divides into two things in my mind. And there are the things that have an objective result and those things that have a subjective result. And those things that have an objective result are inventions, and those things that have a subjective result are art. And, and you know, th these things actually overlap. For instance, you know, if I create um, a f the film Atlas Shrugged, well, it's using the invention of, of motion pictures and so on, and all the inventions to do that. So art and, and inventions tend to overlap. Um, one of the myths of the modern world is that the two are somehow totally different. They're both fundamentally creative, and they tend to overlap a lot. I mean, Edison invented the phonograph. It, you know, he invented the motion picture. These things overlap. But um, still, you can fundamentally divide these into two. And from a law, legal point of view, those things that are inventions are the subject of, not that every one of them is, but the subject of patents. And those things that are art are the subject of copyrights. Okay, okay, great. Great. And, and, and I, I think that that is a useful, practical difference. And they're both uh, examples of uh, invention in creativity. And, and the similarities between those, between the creation of art and the creation of technology or inventions, um, I'm, I'm going to suggest that there's something fundamental about human being that we can do that. And that and that that is part of what makes us human. And because we can do that, ethics is more than choosing amongst the available choices. Ethics is also the creation of increasingly better choices. Yeah, good okay. point. Okay, so, so, so with that, um, we're, we're uh, coming on the end of our time. I just want to spend shift a, a, a couple minutes into uh, Hank Ranger and your novels. Okay. Right, because the first Hank Ranger novel, uh, surprisingly enough, it's someone who's working in intellectual property, who who's trying to get their invention patented, and in the frustration of that, it leads him to become a new kind of hero. What, what led you to tell the Hank Ranger stories, to write those novels, and how does that fit in this whole picture? So, um, so first of all, I, I, my wife was accepted to. Um, the Iowa Writers Workshop, and I've been trying ever since then to get her to, to write some novels. But um, she she decided to marry me instead, um, for better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, the idea was to sort of illustrate um, some ideas from my first book, um, and then I knew that it was a project that my wife and I would would love to do together. Although you know, like any project that you love to do together. Uh, not saying we always agree, so no, we. No, I'm we sure there have, was no friction involved in that whatsoever. Yeah, so we have some vigorous discussions, <laughs> as we call them. Um, uh, and so, but the point was to illustrate, and, and you know, there's a lot of different points. The point was to illustrate, and, and so that people who don't want to read something dry um, could could do that. And the point also was, you know, it's it's really kind of novels I like to read more than that my wife likes to read. Um, and, and so 
and, and someone actually suggested that it would be helpful in spreading the ideas, which I think is somewhat true because there are people who will read a novel and they'll understand stuff at a novel level that they would never care about it. Uh, you know, they just won't wade through. Um, my son and his friends, my son is now 25, they described my first book as uh, the densest textbook that they've ever read. Um, and uh, by dense here, they mean, I think, packed. <laughs> right. Uh, so, you know, not everyone's going to wade through that. So so that was the idea. The other thing is, 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 is obvious to anyone who's a, a Rand fan. Ranger is Ragnar backwards. And I've always thought it would be sort of interesting to tell, you know, Ra Ragnar's story. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, and so your first uh, Hank Ranger story is more about intellectual property and then the pol kind of the political thriller the economic thriller that comes from that as he becomes a as he becomes a different kind of hero and then your second hank ranger book right go, goes down a completely different track do you have anything you'd like to say about that well um so yeah i, I guess i wouldn't say it was intellectual property in the first one i would say it's really about invention and the and entrepreneurs but i i see what you're saying sure now. sure no um the second one um by the way we were at the time so um we've made speaking of making choices uh, we've made another choice that that many people find unusual um i'm sitting 60 miles north of Cabo San Lucas as we're talking right now um, and at some point we decided that we had had enough of the nonsense in the U.S. So I, we moved to a place called Rocky Point, which is actually in the second story. So it kind of brought home the ATF Fast and Furious stuff. But, but the overall idea between the, on the Hank Ranger story series is that um, partly that, you know, freedom is never completely won. Unfortunately, I mean, the wonderful thing, I, I actually like novels that have clean, concise endings in a way, like Atlas Shrugged. But in reality, real life, you know, as people are, um, such as the founders have said over and over, we have to win freedom over and over. So this was uh, another one we thought would be interesting. We thought that our Hank Ranger fans would be interested in. And probably if you look at the overall series, the idea is to get people to wake up um, and notice the things that are right in front of their face. So, for instance, in that book, we have a scene where the FBI is dealing with, and, and uh, I'm not sure, I, I, we, I got criticized for the politically correct term nowadays, but someone who is mentally slow. Mm -hmm. And they are using them. And our editor came back to us and they said, this is so outrageous. You make the FBI, I, I think actually the ATF looks so bad that no one's going to believe you and that you're going to turn people off. And so... We went and found the court documents and the press um, uh, news clippings on it, and we sent it to her and showed her that this was all based on reality. And so she said, well, if it's real, <laughs> doesn't, if it makes them look that bad and it's real, then that's just the way it is. So people are not awake. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of a way to wake people up. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, so I'll, I'll say one more thing. I, I enjoyed reading them. Thank right. you. They're just, they're just, ooh, okay, ooh, what's going to happen? Oh, ooh, interesting twist. Oh, and, and then, and also in the process, I can't imagine for you personally, uh, technology and uh, patents, you actually go through some interesting technology pieces about what can, what can be done in terms of surveillance and what's going on with various uh, technologies and how the government's using them and how people can use them and, that that is also woven into the story and adds another dimension of uh, cool factor to it. So Thank so I'll I'll, compl I'll compliment you on those books and uh, I'll I'll say to the to my listeners if you're look if you're looking for fun books something that you can get into and enjoy the ride of the book itself and in the process have a whole bunch of thoughts right kind of go through your mind that are like ooh this makes me think i it's it's sort of inspiring it's sort of sobering it it makes me rethink some parts of our society and and really question some of the you know unquestioned assumptions that go on in our culture um the books are really great for that 
Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, so with that, um, is there any is there anything given the conversation that you that you just want to say to? Um, is there anything that that you haven't said that you recognize that you'd like to say before we close? Um, I, I mean, there's probably not a lot. I, I do think, though, those people who are interested in the economic side of the conversation, um, you know, one of the things that I did eventually, and I think is key to understanding um, a lot of economics at a deeper level than, than, than it's usually presented to you, is to understand the underlying philosophical assumptions that various schools of economics have made. Um, interestingly enough, most people don't know that Adam Smith was a great friend of David Hume's. And once you understand that, you can understand Adam Smith's second book, which was on ethics, much better. Um, and you can understand that Adam Smith is not John Locke and he's not Ayn Rand. Mm-hmm. And th- and there and therefore there are things to question in his assumptions. If you find the thinking of Ayn, Ra- Ayn Rand and John Locke helpful <laughs> and insightful, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I, you know what we tend to do. You know, if you and I are having a conversation and I say something that's not quite right, and you know, unless we're disagreeing, you'll probably assume that I meant something that was rational or not mean. <laughs> and that's a very nice thing. But when you're talking about serious intellectual works, that is actually a mistake to make. People, when they write those, you should not gloss over that, and you should not gloss over their backgrounds. I mean, um, David Hume attacked reason and causation and, and, um, and ethics, um, and Adam Smith never, ever really talks about, he doesn't talk about natural rights. He doesn't talk about Locke. He is not the same. He's not the same. He's not the same as what, for instance, he's not operating on the same assumptions as the founders who created the Declaration of Independence. Just as an example of why it's worth digging deeper. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And and uh, if you're into economics, I highly recommend a uh, source of economic growth to to uh to be exposed to the foundations the fundamental questions of economics from a new lens and to really look at how how does the rationality of human beings working in reality right with ethical responsibilities right in terms of how we work with respect how does realization how how does invention play into the human condition? How central is it? And if you're interested in Ayn Rand, uh, uh, Dale does uh, a phenomenal job of opening up and bringing together just the fundamental ideas that have you inspired by Ayn Rand in an economic context. And that'll, that will cause you to rethink a lot of the other economic ideas and thinking that you've done. So I'll recommend that. Okay, so with that... Thank you, Dale. It's been quite it's been quite the ride. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Okay. And uh, by the way, uh, both both Dale and I are speaking at Atlas Summit, which is part of Freedom Fest in uh, July twelfth uh, through uh, or eleventh through uh, the eleventh and twelfth. Yeah, oh, the eleventh well, yes. and twelfth is Atlas Summit, and then there's another day with Atlas Summit, and Freedom Fest is that five days. If, you, if you're interested in libertarian, uh, freedom-oriented ideas, if you're interested in rational politics, right, I highly encourage you to consider going to it. If you go to Freedom Fest, you kind of get Atlas Summit as part of it, or just come to Atlas Summit. It's going to be great fun. There's going to be great people. I'm looking forward to seeing you there, Dale. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a good one. You too. Bye.